I'm Sandy Mazel. I'm the chair of the government department at Colby. Uh, I'm saying that only because I'm the only person up here I've never heard of, and I thought some of you <laughs> might need to know who I am. It is a great honor for me uh, to have the opportunity to moderate this panel, which is a continuation of the event celebrating the inauguration of David Green as our 20th president. My role today is really quite uh, simple. With me at this table are four distinguished uh, citizens who are all receiving honorary degrees uh, from Colby. They are familiar to all of you. Uh, and if some of you, them are not as familiar to you, you were given biographies of them as they came in. We've asked them to discuss what we all think is a very important topic. The role that an institution such as Colby, or the University of Chicago, or Harvard, uh, plays in developing tomorrow's leaders, engaged citizens whom we hope will be able to lead our state, the nation, and the world with a level of discourse and civility that has too often been absent in recent years. Citizens throughout our nation are disheartened and divided by rampant partisanship in Washington and in many of our state capitals. Approval ratings for government institutions are at or near all-time lows. The dialogue of public discourse is often acerbic and bitter. In part, I feel this situation is, is the result of legitimate policy differences that divide our nation. But in a larger part, the problem might well be the ways in which we discuss these problems with each other. Our college campuses are fertile grounds for airing fundamental differences. Intense and rigorous debate regarding critical issues, studying the most important problems of the day and letting our inquiry take us where it, the evidence leads, and vigorously defending positions that we hold in public forums define the very essence of a college or a university. The broad question we will ask our panelists is to address, to address is how we transmit those values which are inherent in the concept of academic freedom, which are in the campus traditions of open disagreement and protest in all of our institutions, how do we, we change that to a commitment to civility and discourse as they become engaged citizens capable of raising the level of public debate that we are currently witnessing? That's a big topic. I think we have panelists who are more than capable of dealing with it. I'm going to introduce each of them briefly and pose one question to each. And after they answer those questions, I hope that we have a free-flowing discussion among all of them. After about 15 or 20 minutes of that discussion, I will turn the uh, floor over to you to ask questions of our panelists as well. So let me introduce them in the order in which they are going to be speaking. Um, to my immediate left is Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, Emily Hargroves Fisher, Professor of Education at the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. Professor Lawrence Lightfoot is a renowned educational sociologist who, and this just sort of is a scholar amazes me, invented a research methodology called <laughs> portraiture which brings together in really exciting and interesting ways the worlds of aesthetics and science. And I have to say, uh, while I am in awe of all of our honorary degree panelists, I've spent a great deal of time reading your work in the last month. And at some point, I'd love to have the opportunity to sit down and talk about it at great length. Uh, Professor Lawrence Lightfoot's classes and her research have focused on the relationships between educational institutions and our society and how we change during our lifespans. Speaking second, and to Professor Lawrence Lightfoot's left, is Robert Zimmer, president of the University of Chicago. President Zimmer was a leader of the mathematics faculty at Chicago before he moved into the administration, known as the dark side. First <laughs> at Chicago, then as provost at Brown, and since, 19, and since 2006, back at Chicago as the university's 13th president. He has a deserved reputation as an educational reformer and a fierce defender of academic freedom. To my right, though I have to tell a story, I once had Senator Mitchell here in the old days, to, and he was to my left, and as I started to introduce him, he got up and he said, I'm never going to be to Sandy Mazel's left, and immediately <laughs> moved to my right. <laughs> so you are appropriately to my right. <laughs> Actually, I'd be more appropriate. Right, right in the right center. Do <laughs> you want to switch? <laughs> Susan Collins, a senior United States Senator from Maine, 
has a long familial tie to Colby. Professor Tuar Mazeo holds the Quera C. Piper, class of 1914, chair in English. The C in the Quera C. Piper chair stands for Collins. Later this afternoon, we are going to be pleased to welcome Senator Collins to the family of Colby alumni, which also includes Wilson C. Piper, class of 39, Clara Piper's uh, son. And Wilson Piper was a longtime trustee and vice chairman of the Board of Trustees, and some of the students out here may well live in Piper Dormitory, which was named for Wilson Piper. Senator Collins, as she just noted, has developed a <laughs> widely recognized reputation as a bridge builder in the Senate, as somebody who, in fact, crosses that partisan divide and often works very hard in order to make sure that that divide does not run more deeply than it does. And finally, to Senator Collins' right, clearly not ideologically positioned, <laughs> is, is David Axelrod, the director of the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. David Axelrod was a successful, an incredibly successful political strategist who saw the impact of our divisive politics both during campaigns and then later while serving as a senior advisor to President Obama during, the first, during President Obama's first term. He has now returned to his alma mater where he directs a program that connects the theoretical material presented in the classroom, in many classrooms, to the world of practical politics, governing, and journalism, and he does so in an incredibly bipartisan way. So now, having given those introductions, we please welcome our honorary degree recipient. <laughs> Professor Lawrence Lightfoot, for more than three decades, you have analyzed questions about respect, the relationship between families and schools, what constitute a good, constitutes a good high school, and changes we all go through as our lives unfold. I wonder if you could start us off by talking about your views of how individuals develop a sense of respect, of participating in conversations in which they listen to the views different from their own and respond as part of a civil dialogue. Right. Well, actually, it's been more like four decades that I've been out there, <laughs> not three, uh, studying uh, schools and education and the relationships between schools and communities. And I've literally visited hundreds of schools across this country of a variety of types, poor city schools, affluent suburban schools, rich, fancy preparatory academies, remote rural schools. And in all of them across these four decades, I've made sure to ask students who their good teachers are and why they are good, whatever I'm studying. And the answer across all these four decades and across all these different kinds of schools are always the same. Why do we think Mrs. Browning is a good teacher, they ask me, as if they think I should know the answer? Because they say she respects us, and I push further. What do you mean by respect? She takes us seriously. She holds, holds high standards for us. She listens to us, and she sees us. She knows who we are. These are consistent answers across all of these settings and across all of these years. And even some students even point to something else that I think is critical. They say, this teacher is fearless and unafraid. Fearless in what ways, I ask? Well, fearless in knowing us and being known by us. She makes herself vulnerable in our presence. Fearless in managing difficult conversations and asking probing and impertinent and sometimes unanswerable questions. Fearless in facing the incoherence around us. I mean, they don't always use these words. I <laughs> <laughs> My take on these words. <laughs> um, and fearless in withstanding the silence that is often part of disruptive discourse in classrooms and conflict in classrooms. So respect grows in relationships of, um, of high standards, rigor, expectation, and empathy. Um, and we need to always think of it as growing in relationship, but it's not an abstraction out here somewhere. And we also need to think um, of respect as dynamic and, re and reciprocal. Um, 
One of the things that I think is important as well to think about as we think about growing good liberal arts classrooms is not only the ways in which teachers encourage in good liberal arts classrooms critical thinking, deep analysis, uh, the development of nuanced and, and uh, complex, thoughtful argument, uh, all of those things that have to do with kind of learning how to pursue knowledge and to ask good questions. There's another kind of very important agenda, I think, that's part of um, having good liberal arts education, which is very much related to relationships of respect. And that is, these classrooms are places, I think, where people can develop a sense of who they are, questions of identity and questions of voice. Who am I? Where do I come from? What do I believe? Um, how can I speak up? Uh, what do I want to speak up about? And so I think that when we think about young people developing an identity um, and learning who they are, it's clear to me that the best way to learn that is to be among people who are different from you. So that I think of good liberal arts classrooms as being places of diversity of all kinds diversity of perspectives, diversity of backgrounds, diversity of cultures, and race, and class, and gender. Um, and, and that as we form, as any individual forms an identity, it becomes clear. It becomes more, more sweetly etched if you are interacting with people who are different from you. And if you have to confront in the normal daily discourse, differences and contrasts of opinion and perspective. Um, and so I think that one of the things which good teachers do in those settings is not only offer their respect, listen attentively, be fearless in facing the discourses, but providing a safe space for people to really listen to the differences, to attend to the differences, and then in some ways to have revealed the universalities, because that's what happens as people begin to engage in contrasting perspectives, even in difficult, contentious discourse, we discover sometimes not only who we are and what we believe, we discover a way to stand up and give voice to that, that we feel deeply, and we discover a way to see ourselves in relation to others. So um, I think that's the beginning. That's a, that's a terrific beginning. Thank you so much. Uh, President Zimmer. <laughs> the University of Chicago is known for many, many things. But for our purposes today, one of the most important is that it is known as a place that fosters healthy dialogue. Some of us remember the agenda-setting Calvin, Calvin report on the, on the university's role in po political and social action that came out in the late 1960s after the uh, series of urban unrest in a number of our cities. Uh, more recently, an ad hoc committee at the university issued a report that made recommendations respond about how the university should respond to protest and to dissent. Can you give us some of your views of how these institutional responses impact on the campus culture at the University of Chicago, how they could at a place like Colby as well, and how they, they uh, impact on individual reactions to situations that might, uh, in other cases, lead to less than civil engagement? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so let me begin uh, just by uh, expanding a little bit on uh, Sandy's introduction, which I think is a friendly amendment because it gives a little <laughs> bit of, uh, of context to what I want to say about uh, institutional uh, response. And that is that uh, what one has in an educational environment and what's important, important to foster is not only a uh, a sense of debate, not only a sense of uh, being able to stand up and argue, but actually a sense of, uh, of listening and being able to uh, think of your own arguments in a limited way, that every given argument is in fact a limited argument, that it has uh, power but it also has limitations, and that you need to see your own discourse in a larger context that takes place with other uh, perspectives, other views, and so on. This is actually a very difficult thing uh, to do. Uh, it's, it's easy to say, uh, but it's, it's actually quite hard. People, individuals, mostly have a very difficult time, uh, difficult time with this. 
uh, it's much easier uh, to be uh, talking to people who have the same worldview as you do, uh, who are going to reinforce your views. A lot of people think of argument as an exercise in convincing the other person that they are incorrect and that you are correct. Uh, we've all done that. Uh, uh, but uh, in a larger sense, argument is actually about trying to understand the complexity of situations, uh, the multiple ways of looking at them, and how understanding derives out of an attempt to integrate multiple perspectives and not uh, succumb to simplicity. Uh, the temptation to succumb to simplicity uh, is, is powerful, and it's uh, one of the things one needs to uh, deal with constantly. Now, when I say this is difficult, uh, it's difficult on two levels, and one I will get to uh, directly to Sandy's question. It's difficult, as I say, uh, for individuals, which is why, uh, the, why it needs to be worked at, why uh, from the beginning of one's education uh, through uh, higher education, one actually needs to work at creating environments in which this type of actual argument, in which you're learning through argument, not just debating, uh, takes place. Uh, that's a lot of work, uh, mostly uh, because it's, uh, it, it's, it's simply difficult. Now you get to the question about institutions. And uh, what I've said is easy for most institutions to subscribe to. Yes, we believe that. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, the problem is institutions believe other things too, and they often come in conflict. Uh, there are such things as legitimate competing interests. I've articulated one, a powerful interest for an institution, and I think there are few educational institutions that would listen to what I said and said, oh, well, uh, yeah, of course, uh, we want to do that. There are few who wouldn't do, say that. But uh, the question is not what do you think is good, but where does this sit in your priority list? Uh, what's going to trump this under various circumstances? Uh, how important is it to you that your students feel comfortable? What does that mean? Uh, there's a great deal of, uh, of sense of comfort. You hear a lot of people saying, well, there, there's something wrong in that room because a group of people felt uncomfortable. Uh, my answer to that is always, uh, it's a university. People are supposed to feel uncomfortable. Uh, if people are not feeling uncomfortable, we're not doing our job. Now, there are all sorts of layers of this, and it comes out in all sorts of ways. But the question is, for you as an institution, what trumps what? Not what do you subscribe to in general is a good thing, but where are your priorities? Now, the difference for the University of Chicago that Sandy alluded to is that consistently, from the beginning, uh, through uh, today, the University of Chicago has taken these sets of values as its highest values. And we come into uh, conflict with, uh, around this because there are people who think uh, we should do things that are good, that we should take political stands, that we should speak up as an institution for, uh, for this or that, depending on what they happen to believe. And there's a lot of pressure to do that. There's a lot of pressure from students. There's sometimes pressure for alums. Uh, there's typically less pressure from faculty at, at Chicago, but there are uh, places, uh, I'm familiar with some, uh, where, in fact, the faculty want you to take a position as, as an institution. Uh, University of Chicago has uh, systematically refused to do this. This has come up, for example, around questions of divestment. Uh, and I will tell you, we were virtually the only institution during the uh, situation in the Sudan that took a principled position against divestment. We didn't dodge the question. We made a principled statement about why this fit in to what we believe is the way to preserve in a maximal way the free and open academic environment that, uh, that we've uh, alluded to here. So uh, this, I think, is the question for a lot of institutions. Who are you? Uh, what do you want to be? What do you stand for? Uh, saying you stand for what I said is not sufficient. 
The question is, is it going to trump other things or are other things going to trump that? Thank you very much. Senator, we could change seats if you want to make sure that this is right, but for, for your entire political career and certainly for the time that you have been in the Senate, uh, you've been known for seeking bipartisan solutions to seemingly intractable problems that others have sought to present in a, in a partisan way. And for your efforts in doing that, you've been attacked from both the left and from the right. Uh, many of us wish that more of your colleagues in the Senate understood that compromise and negotiation are not dirty words, that in fact it's what we send people to Washington to do. But I'm interested in whether you have specific ideas to find a way back to a Senate where senators cross the aisle more frequently they do, than they do now in seeking bipartisan or nonpartisan solutions uh, in a way that makes the citizenry feel that the Senate and the House are more productive than they are now. Thank you, Sandy. Before I get to my specific ideas, let me first describe what I think civility is and what it isn't. Civility does not mean meaningless discourse that is devoid of any principle or passion. What it does mean is being respectful to those who have different views listening carefully, being open to new ideas, and in the Senate, searching for common ground. I've thought of many of the speeches throughout our history, such as Senate Margaret Chase Smith's confrontation of Joseph McCarthy. That was an important <coughs> speech. It may, in some ways, have struck people is not civil, but the difference was that she went to the Senate floor to denounce McCarthy's tactics and not to call him an evil man. And that is one of the key parts of civility, is to try not to personalize it, but instead discuss the issue. As a very specific example, Last fall, just about this time, uh, the government went into a 16-day shutdown. And I remember on October 5th, a Saturday, being in my office and watching the floor debate as senators alternated from Democrat to Republican, pointing the finger at the other side, casting blame, and not one of them offering a proposal to solve the impasse. I finally couldn't stand it any longer and went to the floor and I gave a speech in which I urged my colleagues to come out of their partisan corners to stop fighting and start legislating in a manner that was worthy of the people of this great nation. And luckily for me, in the chair was my colleague from Maine, Angus King. So someone had to listen to my <laughs> <laughs> The most interesting thing is what happened next. The second I left the floor, having outlined my plan for reopening government, my cell phone started ringing. The first call was from Lisa Murkowski, a Republican from Alaska. The second from Kelly Ayotte, a Republican from New Hampshire. The third, Amy Klobuchar, a Democrat from Minnesota. The women here will see a pattern. <laughs> <laughs> now, and I must say that I do believe the women in the Senate tend to be more collaborative in their approach. We share very different views. We span the political spectrum, but we tend to be more interested in solving problems and less interested in scoring partisan political points. Well, out of that experience, I convened what I call the Common Sense Coalition. And we met, and we had some good men who joined us as well, I should make that clear, <laughs> including Angus King. And we spent day and night putting together a plan that we presented to our leaders, and it led to an earlier reopening of government. 
And what is encouraging to me is after that success, I started getting calls from members on both sides of the aisle wanting to join our caucus to work on other issues. All of a sudden, for once in my life, I was the cool kid. Everybody <laughs> wanted to be part of my group. Uh, but I think that should give us hope that, in fact, there is a center in the Senate that does have a sufficient number of members that we could join together and work to get things done. Another specific change that I would propose is we should change the rules of the Senate back to what they were. When the rule changes were pushed through at the beginning of this year, it poisoned the well in the Senate. But more important, it took the Senate away from its tradition as being the body that respected minority rights. We're different from the House. That's why it does take a supermajority in the Senate to pass legislation. And when the rules were changed in response to abuses on both sides of the aisle, including the overuse of the filibuster by my party, but also the Democratic leader's refusal to let Republicans offer alternatives on the Senate floor. It took the Senate away from being the world's greatest deliberative body. And I hope that if Republicans gain control of the Senate, I realize a prospect that fills 90% of this room with horror. Uh, <laughs> that the first thing that we will do is change the rules back and not seek to retaliate against our Democratic colleagues. And that's something that I think would do, go a long ways to restoring civility and open debate in the Senate that can lead to the kind of compromises and solutions to the huge problems facing our nation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Senator, just looking at the front row in front of me, I think you have an estimate of a little too high of how many people don't look at that with. <laughs> <laughs> it may be more than that. Mr. Axelrod, yes. as a political strategist for President Obama and for many others, your job was to win elections. Without putting too fine a point on it, that might well mean finding your opponent's weaknesses and exploiting those weaknesses. In the White House, I assume, you saw some of those consequences of governing from a par in a polarized political environment that now exists. Now you've turned to academia, what we've talked about on, on my left, at the Institute of Politics. And you have brought together at the Institute Republicans and Democrats, labor leaders and business leaders, politicians and office holders and journalists, including our own Amy Walter. Uh, from their comments, which I have read on your website, they all seem to get along. They all seem to enjoy the camaraderie of being with people who um, normally they would not be associating with. And they seem to benefit, to benefit from the interactions they've had with the University of Chicago students. What I'd like to know is if you can draw lessons from those experiences about what the students at the University of Chicago gain from that kind of engagement, the same kind of engagement we've tried to foster here at Colby through the Goldfarb Center. Well, I won't dwell on your <coughs> predicate. Uh, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that some would suggest in my old profession, Bob, that getting people to succumb to simplicity was part of the deal. But I uh, will <laughs> leave that. I am very, very pleased to be here. First of all, I've come to really enjoy presidential inaugurations. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm always up for one. <laughs> though, though I must say, to, in order to accept this invitation, I had to overcome my deep resentment as a, uh, as a person who works at the University of Chicago that you've stolen away uh, David Green, who uh, is uh, an extraordinary person, and uh, uh, I'm honored to be here to honor him. Um, the fact is that Susan Collins, you, and I'm proud to sit next to her, is a bridge builder, but there isn't enough steel sometimes to build bridges these days between the chasm that's grown between the parties, and she is, in fact, a bridge from another 
era in the Senate when there was uh, a greater level of respect and in our politics. And I think that is uh, something that uh, motivated me to go to Bob Zimmer and suggest that we start this Institute of Politics. There was a time, and I think the post-war generation felt this deeply, that people could disagree, where people could disagree strongly uh, about public policy issues and still respect each other as patriots, as people who care deeply mm -hmm. about the country. In the last uh, 20 years or so, that's changed in our politics. Uh, and now you have uh, the norm uh, more likely to be people trying to not only impeach other people's ideas, but impeach them personally mm -hmm. as Americans, as people who care about the country. And that's creeped into our campaigns and it's creeped into our politics. I've been a, uh, a devotee of politics uh, since I was a, a little boy and John F. Kennedy came to uh, Stuyvesant Town, the housing development where I grew up in New York. And, uh, and I heard, can't say I understood everything at the age of five that he was saying, but it seemed very, very important. And what I did get was that together we could actually uh, make a difference, that we could move our country uh, forward and that we all had a responsibility to do so. And that's, what motivated, that's what's motivated me uh, through my life. And I've always appreciated people who are in the arena. Even if I disagreed with them, I've appreciated people who were in the arena who understood that responsibility uh, and wanted to carry that uh, forward. I would like to see that restored uh, in our politics. I think it's essential that we do that. And so my uh, mission after my life in campaigns and in government is to try and inculcate our young people with a sense that uh, this is how to move forward. Uh, and I know there are probably some, there may be some uh, students here. Uh, one thing that I feel, and many of you may share this, is that I think this is one of the most public-spirited generations uh, of young people that I've seen. Uh, you know, I've been an associated with them in our, our campaigns, now at the university. They care deeply about the world. They take things less for granted than uh, we did. They've been through wars. They've been through uh, a, an economic downturn. They know that you can't assume uh, the future, and they want to shape the future, but they have deep skepticism about whether politics is the way to do it because of the bad examples that they've seen. And so what we've tried to do at the University of Chicago is bring people across the political spectrum, and I intend to uh, get a commitment from Senator Collins before we leave today to be <laughs> one of them, uh, to come and uh, uh, visit with our students, to uh, engage in discourse, sometimes uh, uh, together people of opposing views, sometimes uh, uh, they come alone, but uh, uh, to create a, a, a sense among uh, these students that people can have sharply different views and yet still have respect for each other and still talk in a civil way to, to as the president often suggests, to, to, to disagree without being disagreeable and to appreciate that the other person has a legitimate point of view, even if it's not one uh, that you agree with. And so we've had people... Uh, you know, from Newt Gingrich and Ted Cruz to Elizabeth Warren and, uh, uh, and Bob Reich and uh, Jerry Brown and, and a lot of folks uh, in between. And, in, in, and in, a, in this different environment, what you find is that people, when, they're, when they take their armor off, uh, are far more willing to engage in constructive dialogue and, uh, and present their ideas in a way that, uh, that gives a, a, an impetus to, uh, to uh, others to listen. Uh, and you know, it's my hope that um, we will create good models for these young people and give them a sense that um, there is an opportunity for constructive dialogue and debate uh, within the political uh, arena. And as I say to all of them, and if there are some young people here, I say it to you, that um, Congress is going to meet with you or without you. <laughs> and uh, the decisions they make are going to impact on the things that you care deeply about. You may be uh, motivated by uh, human rights or the environment, deficits, uh, any, uh, uh, the whole range of issues that go to your future. 
And the decisions that Senator Collins and her colleagues make are going to have a profound impact on how those things go. Uh, and you have two choices. You can allow others to make those decisions, or you can get in the arena and try and shape them. And uh, my goal and our goal at the university is to try and encourage some of these bright young people to get in that public arena and nudge it, into the, nudge it in the right direction. Thank you very much. <laughs> President Simmer, can I push one back at you? Absolutely. And, and, and I think all of you can comment on this. Um, the, the stance of, of the University of Chicago, not as an institution to take political right. positions, is, yeah. is quite well known. What's the student's response to that stand? Uh, it's, it's complicated. Uh, it's not simple. <laughs> uh, I would say that uh, it, takes, um, it takes students a while to understand what it's about, uh, what it's for. Uh, I think a number of them uh, challenge it. Uh, a number of them question. Can I ask how they challenge it? Civilly? Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah very, and let me give a very concrete sure. example, which I think is uh, quite, a, quite an interesting one. So uh, about a year ago, a group of students came to me and uh, raised the question about uh, uh, divesting, and by divesting you mean talking about investments of the uh, university endowment, about uh, divesting in fossil fuel companies. So this has generated some publicity and so on. And I said, well, uh, you understand the general position of the university is not uh, to do this. Doesn't mean there are never uh, exceptions. And I said we had a serious discussion about this with uh, the situation around Darfur with the Sudan a number of years ago when I said I thought, you know, in fairness, there were arguments on both sides of this as to whether this was an exception uh, or not and that you have a complicated issue, and all arguments don't point in the same direction. Uh, but we did have to make a decision, and, and the decision we made was uh, not to divest. But I didn't even understand the argument they were making around this. And I said that to the students. I said, you haven't even presented a serious argument. You're just uh, arguing by proclamation of, of what you think. I said, that's not going to convince anybody. So. Um, I said what I suggested to them was that they go back and they think about in the context of the university's stated position around the Calvin Report, which is for those of you who don't know about why in uh, the, the context of preserving a maximally uh, open environment of discourse, why in that context uh, the university would not be taking uh, political positions as an institution, uh, and in particular not using investments in the university endowment as a political tool. Uh, understanding that that's the university context, if you can make an argument about why we should be divesting from uh, fossil fuel companies, uh, you should do that. Now, I wasn't sure what they were going to do when they said, okay, uh, we, we understand that. So they went off and spent about six months. They wrote a 70-page document about why we should be divesting from fossil fuel. On recycled policy. paper, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, there are many ironies about uh, the <laughs> questions about fossil fuel companies. But uh, at, so they had this very uh, extensive document and extensive argument, and we uh, you know, we, we got a group of people together and asked them to present uh, their argument. And uh, the argument was uh, carefully designed within the framework of the Calvin Report. Uh, understanding the report, uh, accepting its value, but also saying there can be an exception, which the Calvin Report acknowledges, and saying why this should be one. Now, I told them at the time that I greatly appreciated the arguments. I thought you know, that they'd done a great job. I appreciated that they took it seriously, and so on and so forth, which I did. I admired what they did a great deal. I, I mean, we didn't agree with them uh, in the end, and 
didn't do as they wished. But I think um, it was a situation where we took their opposition seriously. Uh, we showed we were willing to listen to them. They sh showed they were willing to listen to a framework that had certain constraints and demands on it for a well-articulated reason. And I think the whole thing was uh, very productive. Now, that's not the case with every such thing, but that's why it's important for us, and sometimes we don't honestly don't do a good enough job in talking about how this institutional culture has served the university so well for 120 years. And, and one of the, the hardest parts, of course, is people are very passionate about issues of the moment. And they should be passionate about issues. There are, there are a lot of difficult issues. Uh, universities and colleges are going to be here for a long time. I mean, Colby's 200 years old. The University of Chicago is 120 years old. Uh, you know, we're going to be here for hundreds of years. And what is important is to create a framework in which individuals can flourish over time, not to be responding as an institution to uh, political issues uh, of the moment as an institution. So uh, as an institution that is devoted to discourse around issues of the moment, of course you have to do that. But that's very different than saying, we're going to have this discourse and then the university is going to come out in favor of one thing or another. That's not what the university is for. The university is for exactly the kind of discourse that we've been talking about. Professor I, Lawrence Life, yeah, go know, ahead. I, I'm just uh, wanting to sort of make the distinction between the sort of institutional stance uh, that you've been describing and which I honor, and particularly if it's made transparent to the world around you and made transparent to faculty and students, and it's a part of the sort of historic and cultural tradition of the University of Chicago. We all see it that way. Uh, even those of us who are outsiders have watched it over time. And I want to distinguish between that and what I think of as the importance in a liberal arts education to honor individual passion around issues of service and activism. So uh, that even though this is an asylum, this is an oasis of, uh, of kind of uh, complex, nuanced, uh, evidence-based argumentation, even though this is a place where we honor people's differing points of view and move through the sort of contentious discourse that's part of understanding who we are and who we are in relationship to the world. I think there's another thing that I feel certainly as a faculty person, mostly working with graduate students, which is how to honor as well their passion and their connection and their willingness and their eagerness to be connected to the issues of the day, to what's out there and how to prepare them to um, engage those issues in ways that are meaningful. Uh, and sometimes that means moving over to a place, I mean, I, it's very different to move from kind of contemplation, discourse, analysis to what you need in order to be uh, an activist and to be a passionate activist. And I want, at least individually in classrooms, I want to encourage and nurture that kind of um, impulse to serve, that kind of impulse to be part of the larger discourse. Do we do a good enough job of, of teaching our students to listen to the people who feel that passion in a way that the listening student does, does not agree with? Well, I was just gonna say that, the, uh, that, that I think that um, there is a way, at least for me, in which respect is not taught didactically. It's never taught to little kids or to big kids or to adults. It's not taught that way. It's taught by modeling it. it, it people, students are watchful witnesses of the ways in which we grown-ups behave in their midst. So that if we watch you in your civil, in, 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 in how you enact civility in a largely uncivil setting, there's so much more to that than our telling each other about it. And I also think that part of this business about, um, about developing a discourse that is respectful and civil is recognizing that our students have something to teach us. Uh, this is an intergenerational 
uh, discourse that needs to go on. And we need to listen to them as much as they need to listen to us. Senator, I've seen people uh, treat you uncivilly in a public forum, and I've seen you <laughs> respond civilly. I've seen President Obama be treated uncivilly and respond civilly. What, what do you take from that in terms of the way public discourse is going forward in the years ahead? Well, it certainly happened many times to me, and after a while you grow inert to it. Um, but I always remind people of how fortunate we are that we live in a country where people can express alternative viewpoints, even disrespectfully, um, <laughs> to to someone with whom they disagree. Um, early on, it used to bother me a great deal when someone would interrupt a speech that I was given and starting to harangue me. <laughs> but what I've always done is to listen to their point. And it's interesting because often I've had the experience of the moderator trying to save me from it. Mm -hmm and interrupting, and I always say to the moderator, no, let the person speak. And then I respond, but I never let that be the last word of the forum. <laughs> I then <laughs> insist that we resume the forum and go on to a further discussion and further Q&A. But I want to bring up what I think is the, the white elephant in the room, if you will, and that is whether some college campuses have become places where speech is constrained and alternative views are not welcome. And I think about what I felt was an appalling series of disinviting speakers or forcing out speakers that occurred at commencement earlier this mm -hmm. year. And to me, that okay. was the antithesis yeah. of what a college or university setting should be about. To have Condoleezza Rice feel that she had to withdraw from the invitation to speak at Rutgers, or the Islamic uh, woman, the Muslim woman, who, with, who was disinvited from Brandeis because she had made some negative comments about how is some portions of Islam treat women, or to have Christine Lagarde uh, disinvited from Smith College. To me, that's just appalling. Mm -hmm. And it is the antithesis of what college and university should stand for. And I'm not saying that there couldn't have been an alternative forum that had different views going on at exactly the same time. But I think that poses a real challenge to colleges and university about whether or not they truly are bastions of free speech and open inquiry. And I totally agree. <laughs> I, I thoroughly agree with that. As I was, you know, I, obviously I believe in this notion that we have to model better. I was, as you were saying it, I was thinking sitting next to Senator Collins, why is it that those big kids she plays with don't take more from her modeling than they do. And you know the, re the answer is, and this is a long, this is a whole different panel, that the incentives in our We would invite you back. The, the, <laughs> inc the, incentive, the, the incentives in our political system are misaligned. That's right. And uh, there, is, there are political incentives to be uncivil. There are political incentives to be intolerant. There are political incentives to disqualify the other person. And, and that's a problem that we, that is, by the way, not just the problem of politicians. That is the problem of citizens not demanding something better. Yeah. And that's another reason why we have to get to these young people and instill a different set of values. In terms, though, of the academic environment, we had an interesting, I don't know if this bubbled up to your rarefied 
And, uh, uh, but I'm going to hear it now. David <laughs> took care of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know, that's what, that's what worries me. How's it going to work now? Uh, but uh, we, had a, we had this incident uh, at the end of the last year in which we had a, a, a prominent and outspoken gay activist at a, one of our fellow seminars, and he was talking about um, you know, hateful words and, ha and how some hateful words uh, uh, had been ta taken back and made not hateful anymore uh, by the gay community. And he, and he used a word uh, that was offensive to uh, a, a transsexual in student in the, and she uh, left and uh, in tears because he refused not to not say it uh, because the context was clearly not to dignify the hateful nature of it, but to discuss it. Uh, this propagated a, uh, a student movement, uh, a petition, um, some meetings and so on, uh, saying that you know, the IOP was no longer a safe place and we had to have discussions about what, a, what really constitutes a safe place. And a safe place isn't where the language and ideas that are spoken are, are ones, as Bob says, that make you comfortable. Mm -hmm. A safe space is where you can talk about them rationally, work them through, try and understand them, uh, and draw some intelligent uh, conclusions uh, about them. But we are... I think that our culture uh, drives us to uh, those th th to be intolerant, and uh, that's why you get situations where speakers are uh, unwelcome and so on. So we have to teach a uh, a, a culture of tolerance uh, in, it, in order to, to recon in order to reinvigorate our political. It system. is interesting that even at the University of Chicago, the response was a petition, or perhaps it was a demonstration, and not a discussion, right off the bat. Because I think that is very frequently where disagreement immediately leads to. Right. We're going to sign a petition, and we're going to change this thing because we've got X number of names. Yeah, on and, it. I, and I welcome the students. I, I said, if there are people who find this offensive, there's no mandate that you have to participate in these programs. I mean, you have a choice. And if, if you find it uncomfortable to hear ideas that are different than yours or words that offend you, um, then you don't have to participate. But I, I, you know, I, I think it's a loss uh, if you don't. I think one of the issues is, is to think about um, what does diversity really mean mm -hmm. here? <laughs> I mean, I think that some, for some it means the token representation of the other, of the stranger. And there are all kinds of casualties with tokenism. And I know it well. I've lived token, tokenism. I mean, one of the casualties is hypervisibility, right? Another is invisibility, as Ralph Ellison talked about it in his incredible book, you know, The Invisible Man. Both of those alternatives in order um, are, are very difficult. So if in, a, in an environment like the one that you're describing, someone is a token, and feels the pressures of both of those things, plus feels it, that, that he or she needs to represent whatever the group is. The Jackie Robinson phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. The Arthur Ashe phenomenon. Uh, it, 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 in, it distorts discourse in a way that's very, very difficult, mm -hmm. both for the majority who's listening to it and um, for the person who's trying to represent an individual position, not a group position. Um, I'm here representing Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. That's my voice. And it's very hard if um, the, the experience is not one and the environment is not one of true diversity. I think we could talk among ourselves, or I could just sit here and listen in awe for a great length of time, but I'd love to turn it to the audience and we have a microphone. We don't have a microphone. Well, we do have a microphone. It's coming down the aisle to you. Hi, my name is Matthew McGuire, and uh, thank you all so much for your comments. The question I have is, uh, you've talked quite a bit about academia, quite a bit about politics. It seems to me one of the challenges we have in society is we've gotten so fragmented and siloed, especially with social media and other uh, things that are impacting our everyday lives, 
As students walk out into the real world, they will not be walking just into any one of these institutions. Any thoughts on how we work across sectors or how we incorporate the business community, the world of uh, entertainment and sports, just any efforts to integrate some of the things you're saying more broadly across the major institutions that drive society? So, you want to take a shot? <laughs> You've hit on a very important point, and that is, in some ways, the lack of civility and the polarization that plagues Washington is the reflection of what is occurring in society today. As a society, we are becoming less civil. You've only to look at bullying in schools or smearing people anonymously on the internet and what I think is a key factor, the 24-7 media culture that is now segmented so that people tend to tune in to mm -hmm. only those yeah. media yeah. sources that reinforce what they already think. When I was growing up, everyone listened to Walter Cron Cronkite. We got the same kind of news. It wasn't, or so it seems to me, it wasn't slanted one way or the other. Now people tend to listen to cable television stations and radio shows that just feed what they already believe and that do, do not challenge them. And I think what needs to happen in society is that people who are more open and more in the middle need to rise up and make their voices heard. They're drowned out now by the far left and the far right. And I'll tell you as a member of the Senate, if you're on the far left or the far right, you are far more likely to be invited to be on television than if you're a colorless centrist. <laughs> uh, you know. I don't know, you do all right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, people want to hear rants. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking of during the health care debate on the president's initiative, two outrageous examples where a Republican yelled out in the middle of the president's speech before us, you lie. Absolutely outrageous. Mm -hmm. On the Democratic side uh, was the Florida congressman who said the Republican approach to health care was die quickly. Now, neither of those statements in any way advance a civil debate on very complicated issues. But the problem, and I'm pleased to say one of those individuals did get defeated. But, <laughs> um, but the problem is, and it goes back to what David said, the reward structure is not aligned with, with being civil. Um, there are groups on the far left and the far right that if you fit those categories will raise money for you all over the country with just a few keystrokes. There is no group called Centrist United for a Better America. Believe me, I've looked, you know. <laughs> and, and there needs to be, we need to have people in the middle speak out and not let their voices be drowned out by those on the far left and the far right. And that's something concrete that can be done. Let me just end very quickly with a story that really sums it up. Uh, Lowell Weicker, a senator from Connecticut years ago, was confronted by an unhappy constituent who said to him, you are all a bunch of thieves, liars, and womanizers. To which Lowell replied, well, it is, after all, a representative government. <laughs> <laughs> so if we, if we want people who are committed to solving solutions, those, no matter what their uh, job is, or no matter what, whether they're in business or entertainment or sports, to use your three examples, um, need to get more involved. The problem is that moderate storming the ramparts is kind of an oxymoron. True. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it is. Uh, but I, I just want to second what you said. I think one of the one of the pernicious things that has happened 
in our politics is this balkanization of media, uh, and not just on television, but also on, on, on social media. So people seek out those sources that affirm their uh, points of view. So now we have this curious, not curious, but, but I think insidious problem where we, we can't, we, it used to be that we would all identify problems but we, we might disagree about how to approach those problems. Now we can't even agree on what the problems are. We can't even agree on what facts are, are, are facts. And because you get a different reality depending on what your source of information is and it's made reaching kind of civil discourse uh, a, a more difficult. Can I just go sure. back for a minute to the Senator's comment earlier which I think was uh, a very important one about uh, academic institutions reflecting on themselves as to how open they actually are. Uh, and I think we saw some uh, very embarrassing examples that uh, you alluded to. Uh, and that there are others. They're not quite as visible uh, in a public domain because in this case you had very public figures who uh, were participants in, in this uh, kind of uh, terrible behavior on the part of either universities or colleges or students. Uh, but uh, there are things like this that happen that are, that are less visible. And I think it's very important for academic institutions to take a very careful and self-critical look at how well they are doing on this score. And it connects exactly to what I was saying at the beginning around these questions of, uh, of priority. What's trumping what? And I don't think, uh, you know, I was particularly pained by the Brandeis example since I'm an alum of Brandeis. And uh, I don't think they viewed themselves as, oh, this is a statement we are actually now opposed to academic freedom or we're opposed to open discourse they thought something else trumped it. And I, I think it's, uh, which I completely think was the wrong decision, let me say. But uh, I, I do think that there's, there's a lot of question in my mind for a lot of institutions as to how genuinely open they are. I've asked students at other institutions, not at Chicago, I will say, if you're in a classroom how comfortable do you feel expressing X position, where X was a particular political position? And uh, of course they said, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. I said, really? How about if you, if you said this about it? And they said, well, maybe I wouldn't feel so comfortable. And I, th I think there's a lot more of that than, than one, uh, one admits in general. And I think it's really incumbent upon academic institutions take a very careful look at how genuinely open or not they are and what their own institutional stance and how they are modeling uh, for students what's, what's acceptable. I think we also have to be very careful that they don't say that for one professor and a different thing for another professor. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the part that we are modeling for them, that kind of openness is... Mm -hmm. So exactly. you is very different from us, it's very important. Exactly. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I saw Professor Gouveia, if you have, can you get a microphone over to him? Where did that microphone go? It has to be quick. Okay, so I thought we might connect this to the liberal arts uh, via uh, Sandy's remark that people move very quickly to action and activism. Uh, perhaps one of the things that's going on is that People think that their ideas are, and arguments are new when in fact they have been around for a very long time and have been discussed from various points of view. So how might we do a better job of enculturating people into this long tradition of conversation and debate that uh, universities supposedly represent? It seems like the answer was contained within your question. <laughs> I mean, that is the value of a liberal arts education to expose these young people to, to history and ideas that they wouldn't otherwise have been uh, exposed to. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I 
started my career as a journalist, as, as, as Bob and David know, that is far too um, pedestrian a pursuit to be taught at the University of Chicago. And, and I, was a student at, I was a student at the University of Chicago. Uh, so I, I didn't learn how to be a journalist at the University of Chicago. But I learned a lot of other things at the University of Chicago in the college there that uh, broadened me as a person and made me, I think, a better journalist, uh, hopefully a better person as well. Um, and I would have made a terrible mistake if I had made a decision as a, a, a young kid to go into kind of a professional training school, and I missed out on that opportunity. So the mission that you have here is a very, very important one in terms of providing the foundation for whatever these young people do uh, of broad knowledge and, and exposure. And I think there's a beautiful balance that good professors can develop between sort of laying out and framing the historical story, the narrative, uh, the philosophical, ideological context in which this, this occurred, but, bring, but allowing students to see that in relation to whatever is contemporary now. Because it's true, there are echoes and ripples and haunts that keep on repeating themselves. There's very little that's new. It's quite cyclical, the patterns are. And so to sort of talk about the resonances between those early frameworks and, and, and narratives and experiences and perspectives and how those get played out now, I think is a way of both capturing the, the relevance for them now and have, helping them have an appreciation for the fact that none of this is really new. Yeah, so uh, I also agree that the uh, nature of a liberal arts education is, uh, is critical and has a um, uh, has a sense which, if done uh, properly and in the right framework, can ameliorate a lot of the uh, uh, situations that we've been talking about. But I think we also need to be careful when we just talk about liberal arts education because it covers a wide multi multitude of approaches. And uh, it's very easy to have what is called the liberal arts education and not come out with what I would say is a deep appreciation for the type of um, historical, social, cultural, political uh, complexities, uh, technological complexities, and the way these interweave and so on, so that one actually starts gaining some perspective as to how to think about concrete problems today uh, with a deep and rich background. Because too often, uh, liberal arts education can mean um, a, uh, a reasonably unstructured, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and uh, hope it all works out in the end. And, uh, you know, we're, we're way at the other extreme, and, you know, not everybody has to be the same. But I, I think it is important, again, for institutions to be uh, self-reflective and self-critical as to what, what is it you're actually trying to impart with a liberal arts education, and are you actually doing it, or are you kind of taking an easy way out? And I know there are places that, that do, in fact, take an easy way out. Um, and, and again, I'm not saying everybody should do what the University of Chicago does. Everybody needs to figure this out for themselves. But I, I, I do think thinking about the problem you raise and how it actually connects to the education that's a real education, not just called a liberal arts education, is important. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. This has been a fabulous <laughs>
As some of you know, I've done a lot of events in this building, and I've never left without giving somebody a gift. Um, and I have gifts for each of you. They are very heavy. We have this wonderful catalog from the Lunder Collection of our Museum of Art, signed oh, by Peter and Paula Lunder. Yay. Thank you. There is one of these from each of you, for each of you, Senator. It, it meets the uh, Senate ethics guidelines, barely, but it does. <laughs> and as I'm carrying this and knowing that most of you are flying, we would love to give it to you. And then if you want to give it back, we'll be happy to send it off to you. <laughs> would you please join me in thanking our panel once more? And I just have one more reminder in case some of you haven't looked at your email this morning. The ceremony to inaugurate David Green will begin at 2 o'clock this afternoon, not at 2.30 as originally scheduled. Thank you all very much. I got that wrong, Bob. No oh, charge. <laughs> how you doing? I'm well. How are you? Well, thank you. It's a good summer.